Hello and welcome to the Galaxy Training Network GTN tutorial for using Vertebrate Genome Project VGP workflows to assemble a de novo reference genome with HiFi and HiC data. So the goal of this tutorial is to try and show you the tools that the Vertebrate Genome Project uses to create high quality de novo reference genomes and the tools VGP uses to evaluate and report on the quality of these reference genomes that are being made available. So this tutorial is one of two that the VGP has available on the GTN. This one is the workflow focused one. So the other one is the long form one. The long form one, which isn't covered in this tutorial right now, but the video in the course of the video will probably click and refer to it a couple times. And it's probably worth taking a look at it before starting this because there's some definitions that would be useful to know before following along with this tutorial. Um, that long form tutorial goes very in depth and step by step in the assembly process. So every step of the pipeline you run on your own and talks about the different parameters and choices made throughout the pipeline and why they're being made. So that's useful for learning the assembly process if you're new to the whole thing. This tutorial is aimed at using the workflows we have, which are a set of modular workflows that you can plug and play with your own data or with the test data as we're going to do in this tutorial. But these workflows chain together the tools that we go in depth in in the long form tutorial so that it makes the process more automated and more quick and feasible to do with your own data. And these workflows are the ones that are actually used in production by the VGP to generate um, high quality de novo reference genomes. So to introduce myself real quick, my name is Lanella Bweg and I performed a lot of these reference genome assemblies in my time at the Vertebrate Genome Lab for the Vertebrate Genome Project. So I have a lot of experience with this VGP pipeline and I'll be showing you at least one example of a real data assembly throughout this video as well to try and contextualize some of the learning we're doing outside of this test data and in the context of some real data. So with that covered, we can just get started. first step to assembling a genome is actually having data that you can use to assemble a genome. We are going to be using PacBio HiFi data to create our contigs and then Arima HiC data to scaffold those contigs. So since we have HiFi data and HiC data from our individual whose genome we're assembling, we can follow trajectory B in the figure above. And the trajectory just refers to a series of workflows we can use to best analyze our data. Because the BGP pipeline is set up in a very modular way, you can kind of pick and choose which workflows best suit the data you have. So I'm going to scroll back up in the tutorial to see here we have the image. If we click it, let's go and see what trajectory B looks like going to move over here. So trajectory B is going to be used when you have the data, when the data you have is high fi for your individual and also high c for your individual. So this trajectory consists of workflow one, workflow four, potentially workflow six, but more on that later, it's, it's optional, and then workflow eight. What does this mean in actual analysis terms? So it means we're going to start off with a K-MER profiling workflow where we will count the unique sequences in our sequencing reads and how often those unique sequences are seen and use that to kind of build an estimate of what the genome that we've sequenced, what the genome lying in our sequencing reads actually or like might look like to kind of set our expectations for the assembly and also to check ourselves and maybe make sure that we are sequenced what we were supposed to, like ruling out any sample swaps or ruling out the need for more sequencing because this is also a step where you can assess the coverage of your hi-fi reads. After the KMER profiling step, workflow one, we will do workflow four, which is one of our contigging workflows, specifically contigging solo with high c 
all this means is that it's solo. That just means it's not trio. You don't have parental information that you're using to phase the assembly. Instead, actually, you're using your high C data to phase it. So what this means is that high phi ASM is going to take that same data you're using to scaffold your contigs. It's going to use that also to phase it instead, um, instead of trying its best using linkage information as it would in the solo uh, workflow when you don't have any supplementary phasing data. We do have supplementary phasing data, which is high C from the same individual, so we are going to use it. The next step after this could be workflow six, which is a one of our purging workflows. This is used after you look at your quality control for your contigs. So in this flowchart, these green bars represent different QC outputs. So we have a lot coming off of our contigs. We will take a look at these and evaluate if purging is necessary or not. And I'll go more into those specifics when we get to it. But if it's not necessary, then we can go straight on to workflow eight, which is one of our scaffolding workflows. There's two of them, and it just corresponds to the type of scaffolding data you have. If you have bio nano optical maps, or if you have high C contact information, you can use both if you have both. Since we only have one, we're only going to use one. We're going to run scaffolding. Um, we're going to run high C scaffolding, and currently the pipeline uses YAS for that. And that'll be the last step of our analysis. Going to go back to the tutorial real quick. So where we left on was where we left off was just trying to actually get some data to generate a genome assembly. So this tutorial provides the data from Baker Gist, as mentioned before, and we're going to go ahead and upload it following this tutorial. So I already have, I'm going to switch to a new tab real quick. I have my empty clean, tutor, um, empty clean history ready to go. So the first data we're going to try and load in is going to be our um, hi-fi data. So in the tutorial page, it's just follow these steps here for uploading FASTA data sets from the Zenodo. And I will just say a quick note. Um, the data sets we're using for HiFi here are FASTA files, meaning it's just sequences and their headers. But when you get real data back from a sequencing center, it's probably going to be in FASTQ format. So it'll have a quality score attached for each base. But we have them as FASTAs because it saves space for these test files. So in a separate window, you can do it on your own. I've just cop I'm following the instructions from the tutorial that involves copying the links. And then now we'll click upload, paste and fetch data. And then I'm just pasting these same links that were in that black box in the tutorial, that code block. And then for the type, we can go ahead and set it to FASTA and hit start. So you'll see that it's queued up the jobs for actually going and fetching these data from Zenodo and putting them into our history. So the other data sets that we need to include are the high C data. So it's going to be imported in a similar way to the HiFi data. I've copied the links in a different window, but it's just the same box as before. Just here, copy and paste these. I'm going to upload, just reset this clean, paste fetch data, and paste these two here. So let me import this first. Let's change the data type to fast Q Sanger GZ. So these are the fast key files that I'd mentioned. These do have quality scores and start. And you'll see that these are now queued up to be 
imported into our history and Galaxy's already started importing our hi-fi data. So a quick note about file formats. The hi C data, it's chromatin confirmation, um, confirmation data. So that just refers to the process that happens before any sequencing. The way that that sequence is just typically just Illumina sequencing. So that means it's going to be our standard paired and reads that we would expect if you're used to, um, to next gen sequencing. So for our high C data, you'll see it's got basically the same stem in the name and then underscore one and underscore two. Underscore one means this is your forward read and underscore two is your reverse read. Whereas f there's no convention like that for the hi-fi data. Instead, these are, so the one, two, and three, they do not correspond to forward, reverse, or inter interwoven, interleaved reads. These are just numbering our different runs for hi-fi because the hi-fi data that you'll receive is going to be single end. It's not paired end. So there's, for this, file this is all essentially like one smart cell of data you do not need the reverse reads for it this is this is it it's a single ended read technology for high c paired end you'll have a read one slash forward read read two slash reverse read just something to perhaps be mindful of um, when you're getting your data back to make sure you have all your ducks in a row so the high C data is going to take a little while to be imported, but in the meantime, we can organize our hi-fi data. What we can do is go ahead and click our select items box to enable these checkboxes that let us select multiple data sets at a time. Do that, and then we can click all of our hi-fi reads, I'm um, sorry, hi-fi data sets. And then in this part, in this little selector, we're going to click it and then go to build dataset list. This lets us set up a collection. So we can name it HiFi data. Create the collection. Ta da! So now let's untick this. We can click. And we have our data sets, our hi-fi data sets, all neatly bundled here into one entity that we can operate on as one entity as a batch. It's kind of just like a way that lets a way of parallelizing analyses because when for mo for many tools, if you feed it this data set collection, what it's going to do is start up parallel runs of that analysis on each on each single data set. So since this tutorial is focused on using the workflows to run our analyses as compared to our more step-by-step -step one where we run each tool manually, uh, we'll be actually running these workflows on this test data. So an important, another important part of this is getting those workflows. So as I mentioned, we were using workflows one, four, potentially six, and eight. And to get these workflows into Galaxy, you can either import them or launch them throughout the tutorial using a little snippet that I'll show you in a second. If you want to import them ahead of time or just kind of browse our workflow page, you can click this link in the tutorial and it'll take you here to a page kind of describing, you'll see the same image as before, and also describing the inputs and outputs of all our different workflows and links to where they live in doc store. So if you click, for instance, our, the first one we're going to be running would be camera profiling, click doc store, and it'll take you to the doc store page for our um, workflow one. So you can find out when it was la when this version was like last updated, you can find different versions, all that jazz. Another way of running the workflows is kind of as we go along, when you get to a specific tutorial part about 
a workflow like this main set like these main header parts then you'll have this section about launching the workflow where you can just actually click this link it'll take you to this landing page where you can select your preferred galaxy server we're just going to click on galaxy main or org and it'll load in that workflow already and put you into the submission form all ready to go so we can actually start this uh, we can start this workflow now because we already have our collection of pack bio data all ready to go and the rest of these parameters are flexible for instance if you are assembling a tetraploid individual you might want to change this to four or whichever number corresponds to the ploidy of your of your genome of interest and for k-mer length there is a this is k-mer length is discussed at length no pun intended in the long form tutorial there are a few considerations to make when deciding camera length, some of them compute time, some of them how repetitive and complex you expect your genome to be. For the VGP, we currently keep it standardized as using camera of 21 for all of our QC, just so that we are always using kind of the same, kind of the same like yardstick for all of our assemblies. So that's what the default is, but you are free to change this when you run the workflow on your own. So not a lot to change here. We just leave this and we'll hit run workflow. And then Galaxy's telling us the workflow was successfully invoked. It has queued up a whole bunch of jobs that I will just scoot over so that you can actually see them. So the jobs are going to be consist of Merrill outputs and genome scope outputs. Merrill is the actual KMER counting software that we use. It's going to find your KMERs and so the K we set before was 21. You can see it here. <laughs> so it's going to find all the unique 21 MERS in our read set and actually assess like how often they're seen so we can get an idea of coverage of the genome lying in our sequencing reads. So that's going to be what Merrill does. It's going to get you actually that raw KMER histogram, which you're going to, this histogram, which you're going to feed into genome scope, which then uses its own genome scope model, fits it to your data, and tries to make some estimates and predictions based on the data that you have. So that's going to take a little bit to run. All of our data is here already, but it's in queue. I'd give this maybe like, maybe max, and once your jobs are running, maximum an hour, but that's not accounting for how long they might be queued up. In the meantime, we can look throughout the different tabs that the workflow invocation gives us. So here in the overview, you can actually see the workflow that you have just invoked and the various steps. So this is our input and our parameters. So our input is going to be the collection of pack bio data, which you see how it's this arrow. Well, maybe you don't see because I'm kind of sitting in front of it. You see how this arrow is like branching or like spreading out. That just indicates that this is a collection input. And so these jobs are going, these, da these data sets are going into Merrill as batches. So it's going to run Merrill, this specific Merrill step on each in, um, data set in this collection. And then that's because we do that because this step is the actual um, count, Merrill counting step. This is actually counting your 21 MERS in each read file. So you'll have at the end of this three different files with the KMER counts for each of your input each of your three input files but we would ideally want one to generate a histogram with because we want to know what the kmers looked like across all of your read data not just one of them so then this step is another Merrill step that merges those three different kmer databases into one merged kmer database using a union using a union sum operation 
and then this last manual step is actually generating the histogram input the histogram output that serves as input for genome scope and so these are going to populate with the genome scope plots and also information about the models uh, about the model fit and also parameters and there's some of these that we might use later on to parameterize some of our downstream uh, some of her downstream steps but we'll cover those bridges when we get there When workflow one is finished, you'll see that all your jobs should have turned green for finished and successful. We have again our genome scope jobs here, and then a couple of the Merrill ones. And some of them actually, the way the workflow is set up are hidden because you typically won't be looking at them unless you're trying to debug something. But let me show you how to view those in case you do need to debug. If you click the include hidden button, then you'll see we now have the actual read db histogram file and the individual Merrill databases. By individual, I mean the Merrill database for each um, FASTA file, not just this merged one. So again, we ran Merrill on a collection of three data sets. So that is this collection of three data sets, which resulted in a collection of three output Merrill databases that the workflow then merge into this one larger Merrill database. You can even see the sizes somewhat match up. These are all going to be smaller, 25 meg, all about 25 meg, and merge together in a union sum operation is a database that's larger, 45 meg. And this is what we fed into Merrill again to make an actual histogram that we can feed into Genome Scope. If you click on the item, you can actually see a little data set peak where in the small one, you can't really see it, but it's a plain text file. So if you click this eyeball, then it should load in the, view, in the middle of your screen. And when you scroll down, you can actually kind of see the histogram kind of taking shape. It's not super efficient looking at it by eye though. That's why we feed it into Genome Scope to actually get a nice plot and fit the Genome Scope model to it and get some nice predictions about our genome of interest. So the main output from Genome Scope that we'll be interpreting visually is going to be this linear plot. It's called Genome Scope Linear Plot and it has tags that say linear plot and genome scope linear. If we click it, we can view it here. And this is also, this plot is also recreated in the workflow. If we scroll to the actual genome scope part, here we are. So you have it here as well, but I'm going to show it to you just kind of live into history. So this is our main result from workflow one. These blue bars correspond to the actual histogram that we saw in text form, in plain text form. So these are those numbers actually plotted onto an X and a Y axis so we can visualize them. And this black line represents the genome scope model. And so in this case for our test data, the model fits the model, the black line, fits our observed data, the blue bars, very tightly. This is partially because it's a very idealized synthetic data set. And in real life, you might see a bit more um, space between the black line and the blue bars when their model isn't a super tight fit. For real data, usually the black line is not a perfect fit to your observed data, but it's close enough that Genome scope can actually work and predict and give reliable predictions about the genome characteristics. But in cases where the model does not fit or does not even converge at all to your data, then any estimates you get from it uh, should be taken with a heavy, heavy grain of salt, as in just probably not trusted. That's not our case for this test data, though. We have a nice good fit and we can trust these estimates. So I'm going to walk you through what some of the predictions actually are. The first one we have up is genome length. 
So that's the haploid, estimated haploid genome length predicted by Genome Scope. And here it's expecting, based off of our hi fi reads and our hi fi KMERS, it is expecting the genome length of this organism to be around 11.7 megabytes, uh, megabase pairs, sorry. And that does match up with what we would expect for yeast because yeast is expected to be about like 12 megabase pairs. So we're just shy of that. Um, additionally, it has heterozygosity. That's this AB percentage. So it's expecting the genome to be 0.637% heterozygosity. And then this K curve is your haploid coverage. So it's saying it's 25 and that corresponds kind of to this peak here, 25. So this is haploid coverage. So the diploid coverage would accordingly be 50 and that's where the second peak is. Um, it also just reports some of the parameters you fed into it, specifically the K-mer size and the ploidy. So the peaks are also another important thing to look at in a genome scope plot. We have, as mentioned, the haploid peak, this first one, and the diploid peak, the second one. And so you'll see with the varying heterozygosity, for diploid organisms, you'll see that with varying heterozygosity, this haploid peak can go up or can go lower relative to the diploid peak. In very heterozygous specimens where you have a lot of regions of the genome that have alternate um, alternate alleles at that locus, then those are a lot of places that are only getting half coverage relative to homozygous regions of the genome. So in those high heterozygosity individuals, you'll see this peak actually gets higher because you're having a lot of KMERS or sequences that are showing that half coverage pattern relative to the rest of the genome. And this is the diploid peak for, so this is the coverage for most of the genome that's going to be homozygous. Some organisms that have a lot of actual biological duplications in their genome can see also, or like highly repetitive regions can see some peaking later on here. But the main ones that we typically look at for our VGP specimens are gonna be your haploid and your diploid peak. It also is worth noting that in, just as the haploid peak um, can increase with heterozygosity, it, lo it also decreases with low heterozygosity. So if you have an individual where much of its parental haplotypes look, look the same between each other, then this peak is going to be much lower and almost just might just be like a little shoulder here instead of an actual like discernible peak. And that's because most of your region is going to be covered at um, diploid coverage and you only have a few regions that are different and having half coverage. So typically what we just look at is this linear plot, but it should, it's also worth noting the log plot, which we can quickly take a look at with a log transformation where you can kind of see further out into regions of um, indicators with a high, very high coverage. This is useful for seeing anything you might expect to be present at very high copy. So now that we have our estimates for what the genome might look like based on our reads, and just to reiterate, we are expecting a haploid genome length of about 11.7 megabase pairs. We can actually just get started with actually assembling the genome using our HiFi reads and our HiC reads. So I'm going to switch back to the tutorial. And that's this next step, assembly contiguing with HiFi ASM. So we're again using HiFi ASM in workflow four, which means it's going to be using, in addition to the HiFi data to make our contigs, it's also going to be using HiC data to phase those contigs and generate HiC phase haplotypes. This has been integral for helping the VGP assemble draft genomes without a high number of false duplicates because usually when you do just the pseudo haplotype default assembly, it can, you can have some duplicates retained where the assembler doesn't know if a region is 
a heterozygous locus and retains both of the alleles instead of actually partitioning them properly and keeping one allele and retaining one allele in the primary and putting one allele, allele in the alternate assembly. The, um, the high C phasing mode of HIFI ASM helps us avoid this by actually using that high C data to properly phase and to properly phase um, these heterozygous loci. So we're going to just use here the same way we launched the workflow one. Just click this link. And this time I'm showing you things on the EU server. So I'm actually going to click here on this launch page and select Galaxy EU. And here we go. This is going to be the workflow launching page. So let's walk through the, the workflow form. The first input is your PacBio HiFi reads as a collection. So same thing with workflow one. And it's already got it selected actually. It's our HiFi data because it's looking for a format. Uh, it's looking for the HiFi format, which is faster, fastq. That's what it's taking in this workflow. For the next thing we need is our high c forward reads. So as a reminder, our high c reads are just standard paired and next gen sequencing. So you have a forward and a reverse read. And the way you get your real data back, it might be called R1 or R2, or just like it is here, just underscore one and underscore two. Our underscore ones are forward read is our R1 read. Our underscore two is our reverse read, our R2 read. And we're actually going to also feed in some of the outputs from genome scope, specifically the summary, which if we, we can actually preview it in the sidebar here, it's just a text file that uh, the preview doesn't load the whole thing. Let's take a look in a different tab so we can see the whole thing, what we're going to be using. The genome scope summary, again, this is the contents of this genome scope summary file. It's just going to actually, just in text, like machine parsable format, give you those genome characteristics that um, it was showing on the image that we looked at before. So we feed this as an input because it's a text file, so we can parse it automatically. And what we're actually trying to do is get this haploid length because we use that to get um, some of our QC metrics later on. We want to see how well our genome is performing relative to our expected genome length. Because just a reminder, this one is expected based off of the genome scope um, estimate. So that's why we feed in this genome scope summary file. So I'm going to click on the drop down and actually we select a proper summary file because I think it was just defaulting to the model parameters because it was most recent. But what we actually want is a summary file. For the Merrill database, it uses this, it uses those sa that same database of KMERS for our HiFi reads to do some reference free quality control of our assembly. So that's going to be this merged database we made earlier. It should already be selected because all the other Merrill databases for the individual read files are hidden, so it's not going to be able to like pick up on that. It's going to default to this, probably. And another parameter we want to set is going to be lineage. So this is important for the QC tool called Busco, which is stands for Benchmarking Universal Single Copy Orthologs. It's a way of checking for genes that are evolutionarily expected to be in your like given taxa at single copy. So you can use it to check if you're missing anything or if you have any anything like more than once basically because it checks if those genes are there and duplicated because it really should be expected at single copy. So for our Baker Seast, we're going to use Ascomycota. But again, depending on what you're assembling, you can change this to what you need. For the VGP, we usually just leave it at vertebrata so that we can have, we're using the same yardstick for all of our assemblies, even though there are some taxa, some more specific taxa available. For example, for example, there's aves, which we can use for birds, but we stick to vertebrata just so that we can compare all of our assemblies to each other. 
but if you're doing your own, feel free to make it as specific as you would like. And the rest of these parameters, this is just for naming. This determines the name of the haplotype that shows up on the N50 plots and the cumulative sum plots that we have later on. These can be left at the default. Same thing for the bloom filter. And SAC input file, you'll also leave empty. I'll just touch on these last two then. Genome scope model parameters is another one of the outputs from Genome scope. And again, we're also using it to parse out um, something that we can use later on. Specifically, I think for this one, we're going to be parsing out one of these values that actually corresponds to K-curve. Yes, it's the third column is that haplotype, I'm oh, sorry, is that haploid coverage value we looked at before, our haploid coverage of 25. So we use this to estimate things. Um, specifically, we use it to estimate homozygous read coverage. So that is a parameter you can feed into HIFA ASM. So it, HIFA ASM will try to find out the homozygous read coverage on its own. It can sometimes uh, misidentify a different peak though and call it too early or too late. So to avoid that, we usually just feed in our um, feed in our haploid coverage twice that to get our diploid coverage because that's what the homozygous read coverage is. It's it's looking for the val the diploid coverage value. So we're going to feed in 50 because we're giving it this file that has our haploid coverage. And the workflow is going to take this value of 25, double it, and feed that in as 50 into HIFI ASM. That being said, if you want to specify that read coverage, something, uh, if you want to specify it on your own and not have it estimated this way, you can feed in a different value, say 100. Because maybe you're like, I don't like this one. We're going to just use 100. This is an incorrect one, and we're going to specify something else. For your first run, if your genome scope files um, look sound, you can leave it to blank and it will estimate from the model parameters file. That is typically what we that is typically what we do unless genome scope has been has like misestimated it as well and we don't want to use this value. So just to recap overall, because it's a bit more of a involved workflow form <laughs> compared to workflow one to our KMER profiling workflow. We are given the actual raw data that we're feeding into the assembler is our hi fi data to build the contigs, our hi c data to phase the contigs, and then to parameterize our run and to do QC on it, we're using the genome scope summary file to get our estimated haploid genome length so that we can get NG50 estimates. We're also giving it our merged marrow database uh, that we generated from our HiFi reads so that we can run reference-free KR-based assessments of our genomes. Uh, and then we have to give it a lineage for Busco to use. And then we also give it the model parameters from Genome Scope so that it has an estimate of the haploid coverage so that it can then have an estimate of the diploid coverage to feed into HiFi ASM. So a bit lengthy, but it's shorter than actually running it step by step, I assure you. So we'll hit run workflow, and then we'll take a look at what this looks like. Let me zoom out. So this is going to be the actual view of our workflow. So here is our raw data, and then the inputs we're using to parameterize various aspects. I'm going to see if I can squeeze this and let's get a bigger view. Because it's a very extensive workflow. There's many moving parts. It's m a lot of conversion. So a lot of these are actually t um, text processing steps being run on the inputs we're using to parameterize HIFA ASM and our QC. But we can find the actual main HIFA ASM job here. So we are getting, we're piping in our collection of HIFI reads. 
They're going to go through Cardadapt to try and find any leftover PacBio smart adapters that are in the reads and discard any reads with the adapter in it. In our experience, this removes a very small amount of reads, usually the actual PacBio um, Lima or Lima application that is used for demultiplexing takes care of the barcodes. There's still a few reads that have it kind of in the middle, so we'll discard those, but it does not remove a lot <laughs> of the reads in our experience, in our experience on real data. So after cut adapt, then those reads go into HiFi ASM along with this is actually our high series getting piped into HiFi ASM as well, and the various parameters we are feeding into it. And then after that, it all just goes into various QC steps. And we can see some of the steps have already finished running, specifically just some of the parameter, um, some of the text processing ones, those will be quick. Also, I think I had a cut adapt job finished, yeah, because these are much smaller than real data. So those will finish quickly. But the HiFi ASM job itself might take a little bit. So this would be a good workflow to start up and then just go have lunch and come back and check on it afterwards. And we're back. So to recap, we just ran our workflow number four which runs HiFi ASM with HiC phasing on our data to generate HiC phase contigs and a bunch of relevant QC metrics that we use to evaluate our assemblies. We are currently still on the workflow invocation page, just so that I can show you what it looks like when the job is all when the jobs are all finished. So we'll zoom out a bit to get a bigger picture. And you can see all of our jobs have been successful. If it's not green, that's because these are little sub workflows so they don't get marked as green. But all the other jobs which we've run are successful and you can see them having populated our history on the right hand side. We have, let's start at the beginning. First we have our cut adapt where we got rid of any leftover PacBio smart bell adapters in our reads and use that as an input for HiFi ASM. And HiFi ASM has a few different output files. I'll walk you through it in a second. But we also have our, st our statistics, assembly stats. We can peek at it real quick and see scaffolds, which in this case are contigs. More on that in a minute. And Busco and Mercury and some NX and size plots, which you can kind of view in our browser. Very similar, very similar. Okay, I'm gonna walk through some of the results a bit more individually so that you know what each tool has as its output. Um, we will look first at HiFi ASM. So it might make more sense if I actually click on one of the HiFi ASM job outputs and click this info button. It's the letter I, um, not to be confused with the I ball for displaying, but click the data set details or job info button. And it takes you to a page with, bu with a bunch of metadata about the HiFi ASM job that you just ran. So you have all the parameters here, such as assembly mode, standard versus trio, your input reads, these are our trimmed HiFi reads and any parameters that were set. These, I believe, are default, except for this homozygous read coverage, which are workflow sets. Because we remember, we fed it, remember we fed it the genome scope output, which gives you the haploid read coverage. So it, the, the workflow then uses that to calculate it, expect the diploid or homozygous read coverage of 50. And options for high C partition is set. And that's our high C reads here. R1 is here. R2 is here. So that's all about actually running the tool. But for the outputs, we have a bunch of different outputs. And a lot of them are assembly graph files, GFAs. So we have our primary contigraph, alternate contigraph, 
and then the ones that we're interested in for this tutorial and if you're doing a half one half two phase assembly with high c you're interested in these two it's a high c half one contig graph high c half two contig graph so these are gfa format so it's going to look a bit different from if you're expecting like a FASTA file it's going to start with a sequence line so that's each sequence S, the name, and then the actual um, sequence of it, and then it has lines for um, links and also um, any paths that are in the, that are any paths that are to be walked in the graph that will be later on in the actual format. So in the preview just shows you a little sequence line, which is similar to what you'd expect for a FASTA. Um, there's also the raw unitig graph, so it's the unitigs before the assemblers actually makes them into like called confident contigs. Um, this might be better to explain graphically, so I'll show you that in a second. But other things to just quickly mention are the log file, so you can actually click in it and see the standard out of HIFA ASM during your run. Um, this is and also this is the command line that was used. Uh, a Galaxy ran to run this HIFA ASM run. It's a lot of just kind of setting up the actual job in Galaxy's um, working space, so it's linking all of your inputs and naming them, and then actually calling HIFA ASM here. Yep. Um, also, these are no seek files. They're GFAs as well, but I'm um, not sure if I can see the preview here. Let's see. Yes, they're GFAs, but instead of the se on the sequence line, how before we had, you see, we have the actual sequence of this of this of the sequence. We have the actual nucleotides for the sequence. Instead of that, we have an asterisk just to lower the file size. So this is no actual nucleotides in this. GFA file. It's just a graph information, so you can draw the graph, but um, you can't do anything like a line to it. But it's useful for if you just want to download this and play around with it or visualize it in a tool such as Bandage, which is what we're going to look at now, because that's where I'm going to show you the raw unitigs. So the raw unitig graph again is actually a f one of our outputs is a photo of it or visualization of it in Bandage. So if we click the display button. We can see it here. And it's kind of boring because this is this is just um, simulated data. This would be more interesting and have a lot more kind of unresolved regions if it was real data. But since it's fairly straightforward simulated data, it just kind of looks like each a bunch of separate nodes. And then we have some nodes with potential ways to walk them over here and here. This is a place where maybe one haplotype has a deletion or an, an assertion relative to the other one, an indel, because you could walk it from this, let me zoom in, you can walk it from this purple, from this light purple node to the green one, or you could walk from light purple, dark purple to green, two different options. Um, the edges here represent overlaps between these nodes of sequence. So again, this is a very simple example. I'm going to quickly show you a real example with real data. This is from the assembly of the Babirusa, which I did on the um, VGP instance on Use Galaxy Main or Use Galaxy Org. So this is a lot more interesting to look at. This is the same raw unitig graph made with bandage image, but um, a lot more a lot more happening because it's on actual real data of a real organism, in this case, the Babarusa. I'm going to zoom in so we can kind of see what's going on here. You have a lot of these, a lot more of these potential bubbles between the haplotypes. Like, let me zoom in a little more. It'll be a little blurry, but let's see. So this would be potentially regions of heterozygosity where the two haplotypes differ a lot from each other. And actually in here, it's hard to tell on just the image. It'd be better if I could load this up in Bandage, which you can if you just download it and um, load it up in Bandage, but that's a bit beyond the scope of this tutorial. 
just know that's an, just know that that's an option for you to do. Um, you can actually see there's probably even more bubbles in here. That could be where the apple types diverge, or it could be sequencing error because this is a raw graph. It's not popped yet, but um, the large bands or large bubbles are likely divergence between the two haplotypes. So this is an example from a real organism, and this graph gets simplified a lot to make the actual contig graphs when you split them into two different haplotypes and have like the HAP1 and HAP2 contig graph. It kind of just like follows very obvious walks instead um, so that you have a much more neat, more resolved graph to be working with. That's the graph that actually becomes our um, that becomes our HAP1 and HAP2 FASTA files. So I'm going back, we're back now in the, in the yeast data set. And I'm going to go, we're going to keep looking at the different outputs. So, oops. So they have also your assembly statistics for HAP1 and HAP2. You have the files as individual files. This is just, it's these ones, where is it? assembly stats for HAP2 and assembly stats for HAP1, but it's more useful, I think, to look at them relative to each other. So we are going to look for this file called assembly statistics for HAP1 and HAP2. View that, and then you'll, ha you'll have the two, um, the two haplotypes stats pasted side by side, so you can kind of look at them without having to click back and forth. So. We have HAP1 and then HAP2, and here's all our metrics. So one thing to note for, G for GFA stats is that it does give you scaffolds and contigs and gaps, the stats of all those different features. Since we are at a contig level assembly right now, it's going to say scaffolds here. We don't have scaffolds yet. We just have contigs. These numbers are going to be the same as these numbers. So. We'll just be looking at contigs just so that it's less confusing to be talking out loud about it. First, we want to look at, we have our expected genome size here. If you don't remember, we got that from our genome scope outputs, and we use this to parameterize um, the NG and LG, um, the NG and AUNG stats, because those are going to be relative to your actual, um, and to your expected genome size. So if we'll scroll down, we have our contigs, our contig stats. So we have number of contigs. HAP1 has 16 and HAP2 has 17. And total contig length, we'll see that they're actually about fairly equal. 11.3 um, meg for HAP1 and 12.1, 12.2 meg for HAP2. And these both, can, these both do match up with the expected genome size of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So that is good. We do not have any alarm bells ringing right now at the moment. Also, their continuity and or contiguity is on par with each other. We have for we have for HAP1, it's 0.922 meg and 0.923 meg for HAP2. So these are fairly equal to each other. Same thing with the AUN statistic. Um, and if you if you need a refresher on how to interpret these statistics. So we have this long form tutorial. Currently, I'm walking you through the workflow focused one. But if you just go to the assembly category and galaxy training, and if you go specifically to the VGP, um, this is what we're doing right now. But if you go to this other tutorial that's more step by step and more in depth and click on that, um, at the beginning of this tutorial, there's this gloss, this is essentially a glossary if that I think would be useful to be referring back to if, a lot, if I'm throwing out a lot of assembly terms. So this, you could use it to refresh your memory about the different types of assembly, what phasing is, the graph, what are unitigs, what are contigs. Um, yeah, it's just a little glossary to help you move through the tutorials. It's located here in the long step-by-step -step tutorial, which is meant to be really like um, teaching yourself about the assembly process. So it's not linked in the workflow one, but you can just find it in the assembly category on the GTN, and you can use that as a reference material while you are working on the workflow one. 
um, what I went here, where did I go here to find? Oh, yes. So, we'll be talking about here in the hyphiasm section. It's a lot more details about the different ways to run hyphiasm. But also, most importantly, there's a section on assembly evaluation that goes more in depth into the different QC metrics that you get from our workflow. So, we have right now we're looking at the output of GFA stats, which is for getting statistics from assembly graphs and FASTA files. Um, so, you can refer to this if you need like a quick refresher on N50 and other summary stats, also on Busco and also on Mercury. So, Let's take a look at some of the checking your understanding questions on the workflow tutorial and see if we can find those. Uh, we can find answers to those in our history. So here I'm just at the workflow tutorial again, which is orienting ourselves. Yep, workflow tutorial and scrolling to our workflow four. And this one is just covering how all the inputs and how to launch it, which we have already done. So let us actually go to the interpreting the results section. So we did just take a look at our assembly statistics for HAP1 and HAP2 file. And if we keep scrolling, we have a couple questions just to help you, just to prompt you to take a look at the file and look through it and make sure you understand what's happening. So the question is, what's the longest contig in HAP1 and in HAP2? If we go back here, we are, remember here is column two is HAP1, column three is HAP2. The longest contig for HAP1 is going to be about 1.5 meg and then 1.5 meg as well for HAP2. So pretty similar. Solution, yep. And then, let's hide the answer. What's the N50 of the HAP2 assembly? That's going to be HAP2, N50 for the contigs, 0.923 meg. Yep. So that's just how you would navigate around this file to see some important statistics. The next thing we can look at is the output from Busco. So as a reminder, Busco stands for Benchmarking Universal Single Copy Orthologs. So they are genes expected to be at single copy in a complete assembly, in like in a haploid assembly or gene set. So if, it's if that gene is present but is duplicated, then you might have some um, false duplications present in your genome assembly, especially if the duplications are at like a very, or a very large amount relative to the Busco gene set. Also, if they're missing, that should be a red flag. So the workflow shows you what the output is expected to look like, but let's go in our history and actually click through and find it. So. Here I am back in our workflow tutorial history. And if we scroll up oh, no, right here, we have HAP1 Busco results. It's data sets here, 90 to 94. And down here we have HAP2, it's data sets 80 to 84. Let's just look at HAP1 first. So there's a couple different um, outputs from Busco. One of them was that summary image you saw, and that's this one named summary image. There's also going to be a short summary, which is like a text, like a parsable text version of that image that we saw. And also list your dependencies and versions, so very handy to have. Uh, full table is going to be all the actual Busco gene IDs and the status and where in your assembly it was found. Um, a bunch of metadata about that and also the name of it. Missing Buscos, I don't remember the format. Oh, yes, just the Busco ID of the gene that's missing. And you get a summary image, same as before, and the GFF file for annotation purposes, if you need it. So what we're going to look at right now is summary image. 
So this picture summarizes the results of the searching for the Busco genes. And as a reminder, we the data set we used was Ascomycota because this is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The short summary will say the database. Um, where is it? Here. Lineage data set is Ascomycota OshoDB10. And so we're going to go back here. We have it visually as this bar and percentage. And we also have just the plain text numbers. So what this means is C stands for complete. But complete can also complete can mean complete and a single copy, or complete and duplicated. F stands for fragmented, and then M is missing. And then this N number is just the total number number of Bisco genes in this Ascomycota database. So, what this result is telling us is that of this 1,706 genes, about 200 were missing. About 57 were fragmented, so they were maybe um, Bisco found part of the gene in one contig and another part in another contig. And 1,441 were complete. That's this blue section. But 62 were complete and duplicated. So that's this darker blue section here. Um, this is a pretty low level of duplication, actually. Usually the red flags would be if there's um, a much higher proportion of this dark blue relative to the relative to the light blue. So this would, if everything else checks out, this would probably be fine. Let's also look at the HAP2 Busco over here. And it looks similar, but there is less missing actually. So it's a bit better than the other one. Um, some reasons that this might happen in real data, let me show you like this sort of unbalanced result with one haplotype having um, a more com having more complete Busco genes and another haplotype having more missing ones is that some of the Busco genes um, in the vertebrata database are sex linked. So if you are giving it a, a heterogametic sex such as a female bird or a male mammal, then their HAP1 and HAP2 assemblies will have different Busco results, like like substantially different. <laughs> one will have more missing compared to the other one. This will happen if you're phasing it with HAP1 and HAP2, or if you were phasing it with trio data to get a maternal and a paternal. So if you're having a maternal and a paternal, then you should at least have some expectations about where the sex chromosome ended up, <laughs> um, or which sex chromosome ended up in which assembly. <laughs> So we can try and answer some of these questions from the workflow tutorial. The first question is, how many complete Busco genes have been identified in the HAP1 assembly? So if we go back here, so I still have HAP2, HAP2's result loaded up. So let's go look at HAP1. And the question again was, how many complete Busco genes? So that's the C number, 1,441. And then let's see how, so how many are absent. That is 208. So 1,441 and 208. One caveat about Busco is that you do have to select an a priori um, taxa to check, um, to use as the database source. So if you have a species that isn't well represented in those groups and you have to go far back up, Evolutionarily, it might not be super accurate to your um, to your species. For instance, it might just your species might be divergent enough that you have a lot of missing genes being reported from that Busco database, but that might actually be fine. For the VGP, we do just use vertebrata as a common measuring stick across all of our genomes, even though a lot of them do have more specific lineages available. For instance, if we go to Busco and hit rerun, you can see the tool submission form. And then for the lineage options, there's there's really a lot. You can be more specific like Rafe and Fish, um, Arachnids, there's also Avis is here, I think. Yeah, Avis, Mammalia is here. There's also more specific, oops, more specific mammals, but it's pretty lacking 
for more um, for less well studied organisms or organisms that are like harder to study genetically, such as amphibians. I believe there's not um, a sp very specific frog or toad lineage on here, for instance. So those usually are just start, um, stay with vertebrata. The next one we're going to look at is mercury, which is a way of looking at our assemblies with regard to the KMER content. So it's reference free and um, is purely comparing your assembly files to your reads basically. And looking at the KMERs or like the unique sequences in your reads, comparing that to your assembly. Because theoretically your assembly should be using only sequences found in your sequencing reads because that's what's being what it's being built from so if you have a, an assembly that has a lot of sequences that are not present in your sequencing reads that might be an indication of assembly error um, vice versa if your sequencing reads have a lot of high coverage kmers high sequences that are represented very well in your sequencing reads but are not actually present in your assembly, your assembly might be missing something from your reads. So first, before we get into actual interpretation, I'm going to just orient us on the um, results for Mercury. So there's Mercury's results are usually in collections, similar to how we had the PacBio inputs. Um, and there's three main ones we look at, the QV stats, the plots, and stats, which is the complete, um, completeness sets. So we'll look at this one first because it's the smallest and fairly easy to grok. Click on the view and we'll have our um, little table here. What we are interested in is this uh, row for both of our assemblies because it's going to give you first it's just a header and then it's going to give you the stats for assembly one like the first assembly you fed into into mercury in our case this is half one in other cases it could be your primary or your maternal or your paternal it depends on how you started the mercury job and then we have assembly two which for us is half two and then you have the combined stats because what this completeness that um, what this completeness metric looks at is the KMERS or unique sequence says in your assembly and then the KMERS in your reads basically and it compares them so it's telling you that 99.9998% of the solid KMERS in your reads are recovered by both of your assemblies when combined together um, when you look at it individually, like per assembly, this is telling you that 85, about 80, 86, say, percent of the solid KMERS in your reads were recovered in HAP1 assembly. This is pretty low, but that's okay because since their combined metric is about 99, over 99 percent, this means that the KMERS that are not being recovered in HAP1 are probably being recovered in HAP2 and vice versa, because you'll see HAP2 isn't 99% either, it's like 92%. So it's missing some of the KMERS that were in your reads, but those are being represented in your HAP1 assembly. Which is just, which is what's expected as these are complementary assemblies and for heterozygous loci, you're going to have an, the one allele in half one and one allele in half two. This is basic, this is fine. For more specifics about the defi definition of solid KMER, the Mercury paper, I believe, is linked in at least the long form tutorial, if not the short one as well. But you can read more up more on what's on how Mercury defines solid KMERs in those references. So next one we can look at is QV or quality value. Click on this one, it's called output mercury because this is gonna give you both of them together. And so this one actually is giving us a QV of infinity, which I think is perhaps an artifact of this being an artificial data set. So let me switch over actually to show you a real, um, a real data set.
Okay, here is an actual example of the Mercury QV calculator from real reads and a real assembly. It's the same Bobby Rusa that we looked at earlier. So here the QV is going to be column number four. And we'll see that for both assemblies, it's, it's going to be pretty similar. This is not the same as with completeness, where completeness, um, each assembly's specific completeness value might be different from the other one. Um, for QV, it should ideally be the same because the same reads are going into both. Um, and this shouldn't be partitioned, it shouldn't be affected by higher partitioning the contigs. So QV of about 61. So QV is our um, consensus quality metric. And basically Q40, it's similar to Fred's, uh, it's the Fred quality score if you're familiar with that from NGS. So Q40 is equivalent to 99.99% accuracy, Q50 99.999%, and Q60 would be 99.9999%. It's a lot because it's a logarithmic scale. So the, we actually do see routinely when we use hi-fi data, QVs of around 60, but that's when using hi-fi data to assemble the genome and also HiFi KMERS to evaluate it. Because remember, we ran Mercury, we ran Merrill to get a KMER database on our HiFi reads, and that's what we're using for Mercury. So, this is using your HiFi data to evaluate your own HiFi data. It would be more um, interesting, let's say, if you use an orthogonal read information such as Illumina data which we sometimes do if, um, if we have the data available. We have, for some animals, we just have Illumina whole genome resequencing data, and we can use, you can use that to make a KMER database. And you can use that to also check for QV and completeness of your HiFi assembly. It'll let you know if maybe there's regions that were, that were captured well in HiFi, oh, I'm sorry. It will let you know if there's regions that were not captured well in HiFi but are present in Illumina. Usually it doesn't make that big of a difference, um, aside for some problematic species where HiFi just certainly wasn't working at all. But it's good to have, and we, if you have the data on hand from perhaps like a pop gen, um, a pop gen project where you also reseq that individual with um, short reads, it would be useful to also check um, using those KMERS. It would make it more robust, we'll say. Back to my yeast um, page and clicked on the plots collection. And so we have here many outputs. I'll tell you how to read the names of these files. Basically, we'll look, we'll look at these ones first. You have four main outputs actually. It's going to be your output mercury.assembly1, output mercury.assembly2 and then output mercury dot spectra asm and spectra cn we just have 12 files because each plot has three different types of ways of visualizing it you can have a stacked plot that's this st if we click this then it actually um it's it's a stacked it's a stacked plot this area is going to be stacked on top of this one we also have it available as a line graph. So instead of stacking it, you'll see that the blue peaks line just goes straight down where it would be expected. And also we have it as a filled graph, um, which just fills in the line graph. Personally, I prefer this one um, just aesthetically. But if you have sometimes um, graphs where you have a lot of peaks like kind of small and overlapping each other, then a stacked one would be useful because then you can kind of see that they are there. Um, whereas with a line, a transparent line, or the filled graph, it might be a bit obscured. So to go in depth about what these plots actually are, let's start with our output mercury, that spectra CN. So CN stands for copy number. And so this is going to show you the actual copy number. This is the copy number of a given KMER in your assembly. And then it's showing it along with came, um, along KMER multiplicity on the x-axis, which corresponds basically to the coverage of that KMER, like we saw with the genome scope plot. So this actually looks a lot like our genome scope plot. I'm gonna 
see if I can bring it up in a different tab and we can look back and forth real quick. It's basically as if we had colored our genome scope plot because our genome scope plot is this. So we have our, as a reminder, our haploid peak and our diploid peak. Haploid peak is around like 25x coverage and diploid around 50x. So, and this individual has a, some heterozygosity because we do have a perceivable haploid peak here. And when we look at the mercury plot, it's kind of like it was colored. Um, the jet genome scope plot was colored because it's they're both <laughs> relying on the same um, KMER spectrum, basically. So this is telling us that our KMERs at haploid coverage are present in our two assemblies at one copy because it's red. And then this is going to tell us that our KMERs at, ha at diploid coverage, at 50x coverage and around that, are present in our assemblies at um, twice, at two copy. So this looks at both of your assemblies taken together. So this doesn't tell you how it's partitioned in your two assemblies. For instance, you could have your diploid KMERs that are ideally, since it's a diploid coverage, it's going to be a homozygous region, so you want it represented in HAP1 and HAP2, like once in both assemblies, because that's a homozygous region, it's present in both assemblies, but the assembler could actually just put both copies in one assembly and then none in the other one. That would, that's not what we would like. But this graph would read that and call it like the same way as it would if it was placed evenly in the two assemblies because it's looking at your HAP1 and HAP2 together. So it's saying that your homozygous um, regions are present at two copy across your two assemblies. Are they partitioned properly? You, d you can't tell from this graph. What gra the graph you can use to tell is a spectra ASM one, which actually colors in the peaks according to which assembly it's in or both, if it's in both. So um, also I'll tell you about the read-only one in a minute. But so this is going to actually correspond to how those KMERs are split between your two assemblies. So for our homozygous peak, our diploid peak, corresponding to our homozygous regions, it's telling us that these KMERs are actually shared between the two assemblies. So that's what we want. We want them both to have, well, at least to, we want them both to have one copy of homozygous regions. And we would want for the heterozygous locus, uh, for the hetero heterozygous loci, we want one allele in half one and one allele in half two. And so that's actually what this peak is showing us. Our haploid peak here at 25x coverage, it's showing that about half of it is going to be only in, hap, in assembly one or hap one, and about a little more than that is going to be in maybe a third and then two thirds of those cameras are going to be in um, hap two only, which is what we were expecting because we want them to actually be partitioned between our two HAP1 and HAP2s, uh, between our two HAP1 and HAP2 assemblies in a complementary way. This also reflects in our BUSCO scores, if you remember that HAP1 had a bit more missing BUSCO genes. So this is a pattern that you would expect to actually see as well in the cases of having a heterogametic, heterogametic sample. Uh, so a male mammal or a female bird. Um, the other peak maybe of note here is very small in this simulated data set. It's this read-only peak. So that is going to be cameras that were present in your sequencing read, in your sequencing reads, but not in your assemblies. And this is usually just assembly errors because it's going to be, hopefully, <laughs> just this peak of low coverage but high copy cameras. Um, low coverage but high count KMERs all the way on the left hand side because that's going to be KMERs that in your sequencing read were only observed like once or twice so that sort of pattern they're not fitting in your actual Poisson distribution of sampled sequencing reads because they likely did not actually have any biological origin and are just a sequencing error because they only show up once or twice whereas the actual biological KMERs 
like the Cambridge present in the genome that was the template for your sequencing reads are going to be present at a higher copy because that's what you're sequencing. <laughs> the other plots here are the copy number plots for each individual haplotype. So they're gonna, if you click on HAP1's copy number, it's going to be colored according to um, copy number in HAP1. So this tells us that this is, this is good. This is what we want to see. We want to see a red, P we want to see red for one copy on all of our homozygous regions um, because we want one copy of them. And then for some of our heterozygous regions because we want one copy of the alleles there. And this read-only peak is, I know I just said you should see read-only on the left-hand side. That applies for the copy number and assembly plots that look at your two assemblies. When you're looking at only one assembly and you have this read-only peak at haploid coverage, this is probably going to be KMERS present in the other assembly. So if we click this, you'll see that the peaks are basically complementary to each other. And this is um, reflected also in our completeness scores, how HAP1 had lower completeness and HAP2 had higher, but, not, but still not fully complete completeness. That's because these KMERS um, are reflected in the other assembly. So when you look at the two assemblies together, that read-only peak disappears because it's no longer read-only. It's just in the other assembly. Um, just just something to be aware of when you're looking at the copy number plot for one um, haplotype or one yeah for one haplotype only. If you see a read-only peak in the haploid region that you're like oh they should be there, check the other assembly. It's probably there. They're probably complementary. And to show you the example of this like imbalance between two haplotypes that you might expect in a heterogametic sample. I'm gonna go back real quick to the Babarusa. Here we're in the Mercury. This is our copy number. We know it's copy number, not even, well one, because we can read a name. <laughs> but also because here, these are copy numbers, like one copy, two copies, three copy, or read only. Whereas this, the ASM plot says the actual like assembly 01 or assembly 02 were shared. So this is an example of that sort of HAP1, HAP2 imbalance in a male mammal because male mammals are XY. So we might predict that in assembly one, HAP1, we have the Y chromosome mostly, and then in assembly two, we'll have the X chromosome because the X chromosome is bigger than the Y, so that's going to be giving HAP2 more, um, more KMERS that are unique to it compared to HAP1. And that same pattern of complementary um, read-only peaks can be seen here. Here's HAP1 and then HAP2. So the peaks just kind of, it's hard to see the actual peak in, of present KMERS because this one, the, this distribution is a little more like smoothed out relative to the yeast one, but you'll see that it's just, it's complementary here. And when we see the ASM plot, there's no read-only peak. Also, one quick thing that we can note here in the real data set compared to the yeast one, if we click on HAP1, we'll see this blue peak here, a little small, like very wide distribution of two copy KMERS present at like tetraploid or 4X coverage because we have our haploid coverage, like 15, diploid coverage around like 30. So two times 30, 60. So these are KMERS that are, the coverage of them in your sequencing read implies they would be like at four copy in your genome, in your two genomes, or two copy in one haploid genome. So that's what we actually see here. We see that there is two copies of these KMERS in one haplotype. In haplotype one, there's two copies of them. And in haplotype two, there's similarly two copies in them, um, in that assembly. If we click on the copy number overall, we'll see that those peaks actually matched up with this four copy, um, four copy peak. So this would be example, an example of like potentially real biological um, gene duplications 
being present at for copying your sequencing read and reflected as such in your um, in your actual assemblies. So this is to differentiate them from false duplications, which is when a sequence or a kamer is present in your sequencing reads at say diploid coverage. So they should be like in this region, but then they get assembled such that they're in your assembly twice. So if you have, this would be for if you have a homozygous region that gets placed instead of being placed evenly in one assembly and in the other assembly, it's just twice in one assembly. That makes it two copy and that would lead to a two copy peak here at diploid coverage because those those cameras in the read set they still have diploid coverage but they're being shown uh, they're showing up twice in your assembly when you want them to show up once so that's just a way you can different that's just a way to differentiate between the um real duplications which have coverage to support them being there at multiple copies in one assembly versus false duplications which do not have the read coverage to support them being in your assembly more than once. And our step-by-step, um, our step-by-step tutorial, this one, has an example of false duplications, what they look like in a mercury plot, which I'll quickly show you here. We go back to assembly with hyphae ASM section, scroll down, and in the choose your own tutorial, you can pick between doing our pseudo-haplotype assembly method or the high C one. So the something important to note is if you want to learn about purging, false duplication information is in the solo assembly. Because high C phasing has largely eliminated the problem of false duplications for the VGP pipeline, but it still can be present when doing a pseudo-haplotype assembly without any phasing information. So click solo if you want to learn about part, um, false duplications. So we'll scroll here to just, it's going to show you the actual, what it looks like. So this would be an example of a bad Busco run. Um, almost half of the genes that are complete are complete and duplicated. Um, scroll further down to our, here, our mercury copy number plot for the primary assembly only. This is going to be a line graph plot, so not filled in, but remember you have an option of viewing it like this if you want. It just outputs that end in period LN. So as I was telling you before, what we want a plot to look like is to have mostly a plot for one assembly. We want mostly to be one copy. Here's an example of it with a more prominent more prominent haploid peak here. We have a bit more here. It's a little harder to see in the real data just because of the way the data is um, distributed. But here you can see it clearly. We have one copy of some of the heterozygous regions and one copy of our homozygous regions. If you have false duplicates, you're going to have a peak of blue. It's this two copy blue camers at your diploid coverage. We don't want that. This would be what would be a false duplication because it's present in your assembly twice. It's present in your primary assembly twice to copy, but the coverage it's at supports it only being there once, like this red copy, um, this red one copy. That's what it should be looking like. Um, but if it's further on, like here in the real example, the Babarusa, we have two copy cameras present, but they have the coverage to back up being there at two copy because their coverage is higher than the diploid coverage or higher, their coverage is at tetraploid coverage. It's 4x. So that's just a quick tangent or a segue, I guess, into some examples of what to look out for when you're running this on real data. Um, we'll, let's rewind and go back to our yeast. So here we have pictures of um, the results that we had just looked at and kind of a written explanation of what I covered in case that would be um, easier to parse than me rambling and showing different examples. So that is most 
uh, that's basically it for our um, workflow for outputs. We also have these, um, an NX plot, a cumulative sum plot, um, sorry, that's the size plot. We have the NX plot showing um, here like N50 is going to be 0.85, no, 0.9 meg. Our N25 is going to be 1.1. And basically what we see is that the two haplotypes are about the same um, pattern on this. So it's not like one of them is way more fragmented than the other one. Um, similar with our cumulative size plot, they both look very similar to each other essentially. Now that we've looked at our QC for our um, contigs, and we know that our HAP1 and HAP2 contigs look A-OK, -okay, we can go to the next stage, which is high C scaffolding. So to do this, we're going to use workflow 8 from the VGP. And this is our high C scaffolding using YAS workflow. So this note just says that um, we created um, basically, we created two assemblies when they ran contigging. So when you scaffold them, you scaffold one assembly at a time. You have to run workflow 8 on HAP1 and then workflow 8 on HAP2. You do not combine them and run them on both. Um, you run scaffolding independently for each haplotype assembly. Um, so this workflow would be run twice. You're only running, you're running contigging once, scaffolding twice. So let's just go ahead and just import and launch it. So we'll click Launch High C Workflow 8. I'm running on Use Galaxy EU. Click that. And here we are. So I'm going to scoot. I'm just going to scoot on over here. So we have our input GFA. So something to note is that. Remember I mentioned Hi-Fi ASM and our contigging workflow makes GFA files instead of FASTAs? The actual input we need for a lot of tools is still FASTA files. Um, I can show you, we have a FASTA file in here. It's going to be named like Hi-Fi ASM, hi c HAP1, HAP2. If you click on it, plain old FASTA like we're used to, sequence name slash header line, and then the nucleotides. But um, the way the VGP workflow works, the, the way the VGP pipeline works is that we want to be preserving the graph information, all those linkages that were originally in the GFA that get lost when you convert them to a FASTA. Because if you recall from the assembly graph, we have a bunch of nodes connected by edges of potential overlap. And those edges are lost when converting from GFA to FASTA because we just take the nodes. But we want to be able to ideally keep that information preserved. And one way to do that is to um, work with GFAs. And when we are scaffolding and moving around contigs, we do those operations via an AGP file, a golden path file, which operates on the GFA. Um, so the way the workflows are set up is you need to get you need to feed in a GFA. The workflow will convert that GFA to a FASTA for use in the tool that you're going to be running for like scaffolding or purging, etc. And those tools give an AGP output, which we can then use to manipulate our GFA and have, and then we'll have a GFA that has the original linkage information preserved, but also the scaffolding information overlaying onto it. So also is to say, <laughs> you need to give a GFA for the scaffolding workflow. So something to note is that the output GFA from HIFA ASM um, is not the usual 1.2 GFA format because it doesn't have um, P slash path lines defined. So one of the steps in the contacting workflow is actually just um, converting the HIFA ASM output into a GFA with path lines. So that means uh, it's taking this file, for instance, number 52, the high C HAP1 balanced content graph, HAP1, and converting that into this file, um, this usable HAP1 GFA. That's actually the 1.2 spec. 
And that's what we're going to be using for this workflow. So in input GFA, go ahead and find one of your usable GFAs. We'll just use HAP1 here. And click it. Sequence graph, you can leave empty. Database Robusco lineage. Um, Eukaryota is, well, ah, this we actually have to search to. Busco B5 lineage data sets 20, you're more recent. Let's use you. Nope, that was last year. You're more recent. Let's use you. Lineage, we can do ASCO Mycota like before. And then again, high C forward reads is going to be your R1 reads underscore one. High C reverse reads, your R2 reads underscore two. It's already selected. Restriction enzymes, um, YAS can accept um, the restriction enzyme cutting sites that you use to prepare your HiC libraries to inform its analysis. So it already has a few options, a few common options um, pre-programmed. We have our, we have the GATC from Dovetail Chicago or Dovetail HiC or Phase, the F V1 of the Arima HiC kit and V2 of Arima HiC kit, um, which uses four enzymes instead, um, or four different cutting sites. And it also have do has Dovetail Omni-C for an enzyme free prep, which you can use for any like DNA-based um, DNA prep that doesn't have a specific cutting site. We'll use V2 of Arima for this. And then for estimated genome size, this is again just to calculate your NG statistics. So if we click this and just type in estimated, we get our estimated genome size. It's literally just an object in our history with the number. So that's just um, to parameterize the um, GFA stats run later on. And input file, so Army Knife input file, leave that alone. Not necessary right now. And click run workflow. Doo -doo -doo. And we'll start to see things populate as we schedule the jobs. So let me see if I can to walk you through what's going to be happening. I'm going to actually open up the workflow editor so that we can see this in a much uh, more big, <laughs> more legible way, let's say. So quickly go to workflows. You don't have to follow along with this. I'm just bringing it up like this. So we have here the workflow editor so I can show you the big old flow chart of this workflow eight. So our input, we have all of our inputs and parameters on the left hand side, including our input GFA, which as I mentioned is going to GFA stats to be converted into a FASTA file, which is going to be used for our analyses down the line. So that FASTA file is being used as a reference sequence for BWA MEM2. And so for high c because of the way the data is generated, normally if you've worked with NGS reads and paired reads in the past, when you align them to your genome, you would use um, BWA MEM2 and feed both R1 and R2, because those are actually properly paired reads that are like coming from near each other on your reference genome. High C reads are different because they are meant to be capturing long range information after, um, after you cross link your DNA, like in real space. So we want to be mapping R1 and R2 separately because hopefully they should actually be on two different contigs and they can tell you that those two contigs should be brought together in your assembly. So it's going to be mapping R1 and then R2 separately and goes through a wrapper of the ARIMA mapping pipeline called filter and merge, uh, which merges your R1 and R2 and also filters out chimeric reads and outputs a BAM file, which can then be put into pretext map which is, and pretext snapshot, which helps you, which is a way of visualizing the high C contact map. It gets those nice pretty image that we can look at with our eyes. And then it also uses that BAM file as an input for YAS. You give it your context, your alignment, your merged and filtered alignment um, file, which is a BAM, and then potentially your enzymes, if you have any. If not, leave it as DNAs, which is equivalent to just not giving it a parameter. 
Um, and then the output of that, it does give a FASTA file. Oops, sorry. It gives a FASTA file, but it also gives that AGP file I mentioned, that golden path file, which is used to manipulate GFA files, which is what the next step does. The next step is GFA sets again, where you're getting the input contig GFA and the output of the of YAS, your AGP, saying to scaffold contig 5 to contig 7, so forth, so forth. That AGP file with instructions is going to be overlaid onto your GFA to create your final um, S2, your scaffolded GFA, which can be converted to a FASTA if you need it, um, which we do actually to, because one of the steps we do is um, getting the contact map after scaffolding to make sure that scaffolding worked properly. You want to visualize the contacts before and after any changes. So we have mapping R1, R2, and merging it onto our finished final scaffolds um, so that we can actually visualize it. This workflow can take a little while as well. So this is definitely one that you would like set up and then just go out, go to lunch. I would say actual lunch and not just coffee, but um, I can tell you what to do. Just this one will take a bit of time to run. So don't sit and wait for it. <laughs>Okay, so we are back. So as a reminder, we started up workflow eight, which is our high C scaffolding workflow. And we use that on our contigs to scaffold them using high C information using the program, yes. So we started that about a few hours ago now at this point. This workflow can take some time to run. The mapping step in particular can take a couple hours to run, as well as a filter and merge step, and that doesn't count any of the time spent in job queue. So this is a workflow that you would probably want to start and check up on it later in the day or the next day. So we've done that, and now all of our jobs are here and finished and nice and green. So it's going to be the ones we're looking at from this workflow are largely going to be the ones with this hashtag S2 tag because this tag is um, the S2 means it's our final draft scaffolds and they're also this tag propagates from these outputs. The first time you see this S2 tag, it's going to be here on these um, on the YAS outputs, and the way the tags work in Galaxy, if the hash, if the tag begins with a hashtag, then it becomes a propagating tag. So all of the jobs run on with these um, with these jobs as input, end up having this tag. So that lets you know that this filter and merge, this Busco, this pretext map, all of them were um, related to your S2 file your, your um, YAS S2 file, they all came from here. This is in contrast to the jobs tag with S1, which is a bit of an artifact from our old way of um, labeling and naming files, but S1 was our BioNano scaffolded, uh, BioNano scaffolds, but um, we don't have BioNano scaffolds right now. And so this in this case, it just refers to in this case, it'd be better to think of it as whatever input was going into your high C scaffolding, in this case, contigs. So this S1 pretext map is on your contigs. These merge alignments are for your contigs. So let's start looking at some of the outputs, actually. The most interesting ones are going to be the visual um, high C contact maps. So we can scroll up. We have pretext map here. That is the program that actually it gets the BAM file of alignments and it creates a pretext file which can be loaded into the tool um, or the program pretext where you can actually manipulate your contigs and scaffolds. Um, that, pre that program is available on GitHub as a download. Um, but what we want to do right now is just kind of visualize it. We don't have to manipulate it right now in Galaxy, so we are just going to use another tool called Pretext Snapshot, which then gets an actual picture of it because this Pretext file is a binary file. It's going to be nonsensical to view, so we need to load it into something that actually renders it as a nice PNG for us to look at. 
So here is here are the two PNGs we're going to be looking at. It's going to be your pretext S1, which I remember we said belongs to your contigs, and pretext S2, which is your scaffolds. So popping them open in a new tab so that we can click between them more easily. So when you run pretext snapshot, there is an option to toggle on or off the grid lines. Like in S2, we have the grid lines on, and in S1, we don't. The grid lines just delineate, like, this is one sequence in your file. This is another one, this is another one, and so on. They're off in the S1 snapshot in the workflow. Sometimes this can help when the contigs are more, um, much more fragmented and harder to see because the black bars can make it a little more noisy. But um, they're on for the scaffolds because usually there's, these are going to be at a nice enough resolution that you can see it pretty well. So right now, <laughs> There's not much of a difference between the two. You can, you can still see there's some contigs that are perhaps changing orientation because of you see these off diagonal marks that are kind of changing place. That one flipped here. So we know that Yas has flipped this one um, contig because the high C scaffolding can not only scaffolds things together, but can also affect their orientation. So it's decided to, oops, it's decided to flip this one, for instance. But um, something that would be more useful for teaching to see is in the workflow, we do have an example of a real zebra finch assembly. So this is actual results on the contigs and on scaffolds of the zebra finch puts through the same workflow where it's a lot easier to see the impact of high C scaffolding on this data set. So I'm going to just show you a little more about that. I'll click open in a new tab. The way high C contact maps are read, they're, they're heat maps essentially. Give me a minute while I try to figure out the best way to yes okay this is this is this is good so they're heat maps essentially so each section here is one sequence in the input file so for this plot on the left your input file is your contigs so each square here is going to be one contig and it's going to be like contig one two three four five six seven so forth um, and the colors represent high C interactions that you've picked up with your high C reaction. So high C information here means that these two sequences were together in real 3D space. They they were together like kind of in the same nuclear compartment in 3D space. And because the chromosomes tend to organize in little compartments or neighborhoods where it's mostly intra-chromosomal reactions occurring more often than inter-chromosomal reactions, we use that information to kind of assert that if two sequences, if we find out that they were interacting in 3D space, um, they likely would be on the same linear chromosome. They likely belong to the same chromosome because that's probably going to be an intra-chromosomal reaction that you've picked up and not an inter-chromosomal one. For instance, we can see here that contig 2 has an interaction with, say, let's, let's just call it contig 10. That's this off-diagonal off signal. So any of this off-diagonal signal is indicative of places where high-C scaffolding would join these two sequences together because we're following the logic that if they are showing high-C, if these sequences show that they had high-C interaction, they likely belong on the same actual chromosome. So the high C scaffolding takes all this information, scaffolds it, and then we run pretext again to generate this map and get this after map so that we know, we can kind of check to see if high C scaffolding worked or to what degree that it did. So these are the actual scaffolds with the same high C information. So your R1, R2 reads are mapped onto it again, and you run pretext and pretext snapshot on it again. And you can see much larger actual, um, you can see much larger squares. These are where high C scaffolding is joined to smaller contigs into a larger scaffold, where there is this kind of unity of signal throughout it, all along the diagonal. 
where uh, and then so these neat boxes there still is a little bit of off diagonal signal like here and this is kind of an example of where manual curation might work so that is the next step in the VGP pipeline where you would download the pretext file and use that along with other supporting information such as gap tracks or telomere tracks or repeat tracks and synteny information to further curate the genome and fix stuff like this, perhaps this signal. You can move this contig and attach it over to this one to resolve the signal into a larger piece. So this is what it looks like for a real example of the zebra finch. I am going to show you the other useful QC that comes out of the um, high C scaffolding workflow. It is just simply the stats. <laughs> So if we scroll down here, we have GFA stats, and this will actually give you your statistics. And let's see, it would say, it would make more of a difference on real data, because then you would see that the number of scaffolds is going to be ideally smaller than the number of contigs, because you're joining contigs together. So if you say you have five contigs, and then you join two of them into one scaffold, then you have four scaffolds because two became one and the other three were left alone. So your scaffold number should be smaller than your contact number. And similarly, your N50 should be increasing. I'm going to pull up actually a real example. So this is the GFA stats for a real organism, the actual Babirusa assembly that we looked at earlier. Remember we looked at its bandage graph to have a nice example of um, real data and the resulting unitig from real data. Now we can look at the assembly statistics for scaffolds of a real assembly. So let's orient ourselves. It begins with the scaffold information and then contig information, which now should actually be different because now we have actual scaffolds. Remember the last time we looked at GFA stats, it was for contigs only, so scaffold and contig stats were the same. Now they actually will be different because you have different scaffolds and different contigs. So you also have the gap information, because when high C scaffolding glues together contigs into scaffolds, it adds a gap between them. Um, the length of the gap differs based on the program. YAS adds gaps of 200 ends. Other programs can do um, size gaps. BioNano adds actual gaps of estimated size, so they're not all just the same length of 200. Some can be 1,000 or 50,000 base pairs. And that is depending on the actual optical map data. So that's one technology that lets you do actual size gaps. High c doesn't have that resolution of information, so all the gaps are going to be just a uniform length, in this case 200. Um, and we have just space composition and GC content uh, towards the end of the statistics. Let's scroll back up to the top. We have, for, for this organism, it's a mammal, and the expected genome size from genome scope was 2.3 gig, which is about what we'd expect. And our total scaffold length is or, uh, for this haplotype is 2.28 gig, so 2.28 gig, yes. So that um, matches pretty close with our expected. And we can see those two patterns I was mentioning earlier, where the number of scaffolds is going to be smaller than the number of contigs because you've joined some of the contigs together to make one scaffold. So that's going to necessarily become a smaller amount of total pieces if you're joining pieces together. Accordingly, the N50 for scaffolds is much higher compared to contigs because you're getting much bigger pieces. So in s the contig N50 was 13 meg, AUN was 20 meg, and now we've bumped up to 131 meg N50 and 145 for AUN. So these are meeting the VGP metrics. The VGP goals at this point, I believe, are contig N50 of 1 meg and scaffold of 10 meg. So we, the hi-fi assemblies have been routinely surpassing that. So this is just an example to show you those patterns I was mentioning earlier of you, after scaffolding, you should have lower amount a lower number of sequences and a higher N50 because you're joining the sequences into bigger pieces of sequence. So that pattern follows that. Okay, so coming back to the actual yeast data that we've been working with for the tutorial, the tutorial concludes by just comparing your final assembly with the Saccharomyces cerevisiae reference genome. 
Um, the reference genome is 17, is 17 sequences and is 12 meg. So our HAP1 scaffolded is 13.3 meg and 16 sequences. So we're a bit shy of the reference genome, but part of this discrepancy can be explained by the fact that the reference genome includes the mitochondrial genome. So our assembly will not have that because the way the reads were set up for this tutorial, it's, it doesn't include any mitochondrial reads, so we're not going to assemble that. So that just might, um, that might account for that discrepancy there, but we're fairly close, uh, pretty close to the reference in terms of non-mitochondrial chromosomes and also in terms of total base pair content. Once you've finished checking out the yeast genome that you've assembled and looking through all the results of workflow 1, 4, and 8 to make sure you understand all the different QC that these workflows report, you can go ahead and click the I finished this tutorial button and you can keep in contact with the Galaxy Training Network through the Gitter channel or the help forum. And if you haven't already, I would also highly suggest checking out the other VGP assembly tutorial on the GTN. If we go up to the top and go to assembly, the assembly category, scroll to the bottom and you'll have vertebrate genome assembly using HiFi, BioNano, and HiC data step by step. This is a long form tutorial that for our workflows, which chain a bunch of tools together, we're, in this tutorial, we instead run the tools one by one. So it's much more in depth. It talks about the different parameters that are being chosen and why. And it is a good way to just really hone in your understanding of the assembly pipeline. It also has, um, this tutorial didn't cover using purge dupes because we don't use it super often anymore in our pipeline, but this, um, the long form tutorial will have information about that. If we scroll, I think I'd shown it before when we were looking at the mercury results, but if you scroll into the assembly with HIFA ASM section, there's a choose your own tutorial section, which you can toggle between learning the high C phase assembly or the pseudo haplotype assembly. If you toggle it to solo pseudo haplotype assembly, you can learn more about how to purge duplicates if that's relevant to your data. Um, yeah, now you know how to assemble a reference genome de novo with high fide and high C data. Thank you for tuning in.